let us go to John chapter 7. Let us go to John chapter 7. We shall read from verse 14. John chapter 7 from verse 14 to 24. Guys, I I do not know if I will reach the end. I hope so, because if I don't, it's, I don't know, it may be a bit awkward next Sunday in terms of the construction, in terms of the structure. So I, I really hope so. Let us go from verse 14 until 24 of John chapter 7. And so it says the word of the Lord. Now, about the middle of the feast, Jesus went up into the temple and taught. And the Jews marveled, saying, How does this man know letters, having never studied? Jesus answered them and said, My doctrine is not mine, but his who sent me. If anyone wills to do his will, he shall know concerning the doctrine, whether it is from God or whether I speak on my own authority. He who speaks from himself seeks his own glory, but he who seeks the glory of the one who sent him is is true, and no unrighteousness is in him. Did not Moses give you the law? Yet none of you keeps the law. Why do you seek to kill me? The people answered and said, You have a demon. Who is seeking to kill you? Jesus answered and said to them, I did one work, and you all marveled. Moses therefore gave you circumcision. Not that it is from Moses, but from the fathers. And you circumcise a man on the Sabbath. If a man receives circumcision on the Sabbath, so that the law of Moses should not be broken, are you angry with me because I made a man completely well on the Sabbath? Do not judge according to appearance, but judge with righteous judgment. So far the reading of the word of the Lord. About, um, I think 10 years ago, let's see, we are in 2022, right? Yeah, about 20, 10 years ago, I, I saw this interview with a bishop in Brazil. Uh, this is quite a Pentecostal church, and they, they have bishops. This bishop was given an interview. His church was appearing on the news. Uh, and the church caused a lot of, um, yeah, it stirred up. Uh, people's interest because of one new practice they employed there. Have you ever heard of MMA? Mixed Martial Arts. That, that's what they were doing. It's pretty much two guys or two girls who go into a ring. They wear uh, gloves. Not the kind of like boxing, the different kinds of gloves. And they beat each other. But that's pretty much it. That's pretty much it. Uh, I, I, I don't like the thing at all. Anyways. That, that's the sport. And uh, in Portuguese, it's actually called vale tudo. means you can do whatever you want. That's what it means. Because you can kick anywhere, you can punch anywhere, you can whatever. And that church started MMA. Uh, now, you may be thinking, Philippe, what do you mean by they started MMA? And it sounds as bizarre as you're listening. They, they would go, begin the worship, sing, pray, and then the pastor would preach. And then after the sermon, the pastor would say precisely the following. I'm, I'm quoting him. And now for the main event of the evening. And then a small cage would come down from the ceiling and two persons would be there I think at the time they were only doing guys so two guys would be there and they would ring a bell and ping and the two guys started fighting 
guys, I'm not saying that they were doing this, let's say, on a Monday afternoon and they were using the church premises. No, 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 no. This was on Sunday service. And then they, they showed there. They showed the, the interview. Showed, they showed a clip of the event. They, they recorded one actual fight and they showed it. And then they, they, the, the bishop was explaining how do they do that. And here's what he said. We were searching for something. We didn't know exactly what we wanted. But we needed something more. We needed something new. Did you get that? Listen to this. We needed something new. We were searching for something more. Can you imagine that? Guys, I believe it because I saw the interview. And by the way, this church was near my house. Uh, like five minutes, eight minutes driving, no traffic. Maybe five minutes we can get there. Shocking. Shocking. Do, do you know why he was saying we needed something new? We needed something more. We were searching for something more. And we found it in MMA. Now, what about this? What about this? I'm going to get back to that. Let's dive on the text. Now, about the middle of the feast, the feast of the tabernacles, right? Jesus went up into the temple and taught. Jesus sought to spread his doctrine at all times. That's what he was doing here. He was taking the opportunity to spread the doctrine. And here's how it, it, it happened. Rabbis would simply go into the temple, the big structure, into the court, and go into one of the corners. And by the way, sacrifice is happening. People around the court of the Gentiles, the court of the women, this holy of holies where nobody would go. The whole temple structure, they would see, the rabbis would just go there and start teaching their disciples and whoever else wanted to, to hear. So you could easily go into the temple in one corner and find a rabbi teaching maybe 20 people there. And then, I don't know, maybe 20 feet to the left, to the right, you'd find another rabbi teaching, and then another 40 feet, and find another rabbi teaching, and so he was. So that's what Jesus did. He walked into the temple. We know that he always had a following with his disciples and started teaching, just like that. Standard procedure. But here's the thing. The, the teaching of the, of the rabbis at that time consisted largely in quoting another rabbis. So if a, if a rabbi would, would teach something and somebody were to ask, well, how do you know that? Oh, no, because that rabbi said this. But how does that rabbi know, know that? Oh, because he was quoting that other rabbi that said that. Oh, but so how does the other rabbi know it? Oh, no, oh, yeah, because he was quoting the other rabbi that, that said that. So that, the, that was the, Jew, the Jewish teaching of the time. And they all wanted to quote as many rabbis as, not as many, but specific rabbis, so they could say, I, I am in the tradition. I have kept the tradition of the elders. Look at who I'm quoting. See, if I come here, and I start quoting maybe a book by Benny Him, that famous evangelist in, in here in the United States. You would be inclined to think, well, maybe Felipe has some affinities with his kind of teaching. If I come here and I quote, for example, John MacArthur, you'd think, oh, maybe Felipe has some affinities with his, his interpretation of the Bible. That, that, that's how humans are. So they, they wanted to make sure that they quoted the, the best rabbis. So nobody would challenge them. So nobody could say they're wrong because they could say, well, I'm just quoting that guy. You're not going to say that that guy is wrong, are you? So that was their tradition. And we're going to see. We're going to see. Actually, l l let me give a sample. Take a look at verse 27. We didn't read that verse today, but take a look at that. 
however, we know where this man is from. They're talking about Jesus. But when Christ comes, no one knows where he is from. See, they're talking about a passage in the, in the Old Testament. But here's the thing. They are misinterpreting that passage in the Old Testament. I think it's a psalm that says, Who can declare his generation? Meaning that Jesus was not born like other people were. He was specifically born from a virgin, made fertile directly by the Spirit. Not a common generation. It was a supernatural supernatural generation. Therefore, the biblical poet said, who can declare his generation? But they interpreted this to mean, when he appears, nobody's going to know where he came from. Meaning, nobody's going to know where he was born. Meaning, he's going to be a figure that comes out of the blue. Nobody will find out if he was born in city A or B. And then he's going to disappear like that. The text from the Old Testament doesn't say that. But at that time, they believed this. Why? Because one rabbi, one day, interpreted it like this, and he was famous, and the other guy started quoting him, and the other guy started quoting him that was quoting this other one, and so on and so forth. So that's, that's what consisted. That was the substance of Jewish teaching at the time. But Jesus was not like this. And look at what happened in verse 15. And the Jews marveled. They were amazed. How does this man know letters having never studied? How can this man's teaching be so phenomenal if he was never taught in our rabbinical schools? He did not take the official proposed path. He didn't attend the best rabbi school. He didn't attend any rabbi school at all. So how can this man know so much? On their heads, if you don't quote that rabbi that quoted the other rabbi that quoted the other rabbi, you you, you are not that good yourself. You're not that good yourself. But they were amazed. They heard Jesus and they were like, how can this be? How? How? they, They were overly concerned to be appear, to appear to be in the tradition. Jesus was not concerned about that. Jesus had one concern and one concern only. Let me teach the Bible properly. End of story. End of story. Now, they would actually believe in the tradition of the Jews more than on the Old Testament itself. The text, literally, this text that you read, this text was no longer king. The tradition of the rabbis was king. That's, guys, that did not happen from one year to another. That took place in multiple centuries. Jesus broke away from that. Let me tell you one thing. It is your duty, it is my duty, to always look at the text first. How did Jesus manage to speak with such power? How did Jesus manage manage to cause all to marvel at the hearing of his doctrine? Simple. He taught the Old Testament with fidelity. And by the way, Jesus did not have the New Testament. One day I heard some, somebody actually said, Felipe, I, I, I don't like when you preach so much on the Old Testament. I prefer to hear preaching on the New Testament. I want to hear about Jesus more. And I thought, that's absurd. Jesus is on the Old and on the New Testament. Yes, if I'm preaching about on the Old Testament, I'm going to be mentioning his name a little bit less. Because right now here we're talking about him. We're not talking about Moses or Joseph, or or, or Judah, or uh, Samuel, or King David. We're not. We're talking about directly an event of Jesus. So, of course. But nevertheless, Jesus was in the Old Testament on the same power. Who was the Spirit of God in the Old Testament? The Spirit of Christ. So, Jesus saw all the beauty and glory of the Father in the Old Testament, 
and simply took that and presented it to his people. Jesus' teaching was extremely old. Nothing new. Nothing new. The teaching of Jesus was not new at all. Look at what he said. My doctrine is not mine. Verse 16. Not mine. So where did he take it from? From the Old Testament. But Philippi, Jesus preached the gospel over and over. Is the gospel in the Old Testament? Yeah. Take a look at Genesis chapter 3. God said, I will cause the, the seed of the woman to crush the head of the serpent. Right there, the Messiah is promised. That's the gospel. The gospel is all over all the books of the Bible. All of them. All of them. So Jesus say, I'm not giving you guys any new doctrine. I'm bringing an old doctrine. Now let me pause here and go back to my introduction. Remember the words of the bishop. We were searching for something else. Something new. Something more. Have you ever woken up on a Sunday and came to church thinking, I hope I find something new there today. Let, let me tell you, of course there are ways that you can interpret this statement. Let me tell you the right way, the blessed way that this can be. I hope that when I get to church today, the preacher will cause me to see the gospel in such a profound manner that it will feel like new. Now, here's a cursed way. I hope that when I get to church, I have something totally different. Let, let me tell you one thing. We, you and I, we must learn to love the old. This doctrine that caused the Jews to marvel, at this time already, it was a few thousand years old. That's only 2,000 more. It's so even older now, 2,000 years, even older. But honestly, what is the difference between 4,000 years old and 6,000 years old? Yeah, it's old. We want to fall in love with the same old doctrine. Let me tell you how I wish to see you waking up. And coming to church on, a, on the Lord's Day. You wake up, you get ready, and you think, and you pray before you leave your house. Right after you wake up. Oh Lord, show me the old truth fresh this morning. I beg of you, every time you come to church, come here seeking the very same. The very same. Have you ever considered why God left us his message written on paper? Let me tell you why. Because you see, the words, they don't rearrange themselves. It stays on the way that it's written. That's a declaration of non-change, of unchanging. I, I, guys, I beg of you. Look at the title of today's sermon, True Doctrine versus False Doctrine. The true doctrine is a few thousand years old. Do not buy, never seek for a new doctrine. Never, 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 never. Please, every time you hear a sermon, in your heart have this motivation. God, reveal to me for the, for the a, a gazillionth time the old truth. That's how you should come to church. When somebody gives a, when somebody, the, the, the word new and church, they should be not that close. We come seeking for the old God. I mean, not, it's difficult to say old God because he exists outside of time, so. But the old doctrine given thousands of years ago that began in Adam. We, see, we want to hear, let me tell you what you and I want to hear. 
what Adam heard. Think about that. He was the first man. And we want to hear the same message. The same message preached with the same power. It can never be the same power because God was the one giving. So, But you got my point. Th- that's what we want. Now, guys, this, that, is, that is so much. That, why am I making a, such a big deal out of this? Because nowadays, there is so much push for us to abandon the text. This, just to give you an example. This um, pastor in Brazil, huge church, huge church. And he used to be, he's a very gifted communicator. And his preaching used to be quite biblical. I, I liked hearing the guy. And recently he said, as much as I love the Bible, there are some parts of the Bible that need to be up, updated. He said that. I, I saw, I saw the video. There are some parts in the Old, and he said, there are some parts in the Old Testament that um, we cannot tolerate that. So we need to do a revision. Philippi, what was wrong with that gentleman? He wanted something new. Simple like that. Simple like that. Why? Because the old for him was not enough. I ask you this question, is the old enough for you? Or are you feeling restless and thinking, you know what, I've had it. Can we have something else? What what else is on the menu? Last Sunday was Jesus, the Sunday before Jesus, the Sunday before, before Jesus. What else is on the menu? Now, I hope that this church is forever uh, one uh, a one item menu church. Here's the one item, Jesus. That, that, that's it. What else? We don't have anything else. Maybe something. No, only Jesus. And, and that's what he did. His item was only one the Bible. He just taught the Bible. And I, I remember, guys, and th- this has a great impact on, on people's lives. I remember one day I was having a I intended to have a conversation, but and I was talking to my grandpa. He's no longer alive, sadly. And uh, I just wanted to have a conversation, but he turned it into a debate. And we were talking about that, and, and I told him, but grandpa, you are saying this, but the Bible doesn't say that. And I remember his reply. His reply was like this. Felipe, what is written on the letter, that's how he said. What is written there on the letter it doesn't count. What counts is what I feel in my heart. And, and he, he even, I remember when he spoke that, he even puffed his chest a bit more. See, that's exactly the opposite of what the Bible is teaching. Let me tell you what we feel in our hearts matter for. For nothing. He, this is what matters. This is what a f- uh, friend of mine, a very very good looking lady in Brazil, once um, some, this guy was interested on her, but she was not interested at all. And then this gentleman wanted to use an argument with her. This gentleman said, you know, I have such feelings for you. And she looked at him and said, you know, that's the, that's the nature of feelings. They come and they go. So that's the nature of feelings. They come and they go. What you feel in your heart today may not be what you're going to be feeling tomorrow. And let me tell another thing about the heart. Here's what the Bible says about the heart. The Bible says the heart of man is desperately corrupt. It didn't say corrupt. It said desperately corrupt. See, do you know why we cannot, we we need the Bible? Because our hearts are not trustworthy. I, I beg of you, believe that. If you are a per- the Bible says, cursed is the man who trusts in men. Well, if you trust in yourself, there you go, there you are. You're, you're trusting in a, in, a, in a man, in a person. You're cursed. Simple like that. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord. How do I know what he wants? Right here. In the Bible. In the Bible. 
Now, keep your finger there on John 7. And go to Matthew with me. Keep a finger on John 7 and open your Bibles on Matthew 7. Matthew 7, the last two verses. Matthew 5 begins the Sermon of the Mountain. And it ends when chapter 7 ends. So we are looking at the conclusion, at the wrapping up of the Sermon on the Mountain. On these two verses. The last two verses of of Matthew 7. And I read. And so it was when Jesus had ended these sayings. Which sayings? Well, the sermon. That the people were astonished at his teaching. Look at that. Verse 29. For he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. You got that? Jesus did not rely on the Jewish rabbinical tradition. He knew that tradition. He knew. He knew for sure. He knew. But he did not rely on that. He relied on the text of the Old Testament. Guys, the text is king. The text is king. Let me give you another voice. I gave you one example. My grandpa. He said, the text, what is written in the letter, doesn't count. Let me give you another voice. Voices from this day and age that want to cause you to be, to think differently. It's called um, liberalism, theological liberalism. And particularly... Particularly, social, the social gospel. I was reading a collection of documents on recent ones, given on a, on a seminary on Marxism and the Christianity. And one of them was entitled Liberation Theology. And this gentleman wrote specifically this. The text for us today is no longer The text. We begin with another text. The text is our day and age. And with that text, we interpret this text. Let me tell you what he meant. We don't use this to interpret our reality. We use our reality and our context to judge the Bible. You got that? So the Bible was not... The, the source that you tell me how to live is my circumstances, my society that will judge which parts of the Bible are good. That's what he meant. And as his document, they were reading these documents, as the, this, their papers, as he was reading, he made it even more, even clearer that, and by the way, he even said, uh, what is going on on our society. And he even suggested that the, it had to be a hot topic. Our hot topics will tell us how to read the Bible. Can you, get, can you imagine that? And he even gave an example. Prostitutes are a topic that are very much spoken about today. So prostitutes must be loved So, let us see if the Bible agrees with that. And if the Bible disagrees that prostitution is something acceptable, the Bible is wrong. Guys, these people actually said those things. Here I am, I'm I'm giving you an example of voices of people that want to tell you, don't follow the text. But here's what Jesus, here's how Jesus caused his audience to marvel. He kept to the text. But here's another problem that you're going to hear often. You know, I heard this from the mouth of one of my best friends in Brazil. We were teenagers. He wouldn't agree with this now, but at that time he did. I I remember I was debating a theological point that I, I was struggling to understand. 
with a friend. And this friend was instructing me. He was far more knowledgeable than I. Far more. And this other friend was beside us. And uh, as he heard our debate, he said, you know what? I don't want to debate doctrine. I want to live the love of Jesus. Sounds so spiritual, isn't it? What a, what a swell guy. What a rock solid Christian. And then this other gentleman, that I, the one that I was actually debating with, looked at him and said, if you don't know his doctrine, how can you live his love? Did you get that? And that is true. How can I live the love of Christ? Do I want you to live the love of Christ? Yes, that's the thing that I most want in the whole world. I want you to live the love of Christ, believing that Christ loved you and gave himself for you at a rugged cross at Calvary. Yes, I want you to believe that. All that I'm doing here is to cause you to believe that even more. But how can you live that love if you don't know his teaching? Huh. If you don't know a thing about for, let's say, let's say, uh, my opinion. Let's say, let's say I'm a mechanic. Let's say I'm the best mechanic in the world. And you say, you know what? I wanna, I wanna fix my car like Felipe would fix his car. Well, all nice and fine. But here's one thing that you gotta know. Then, you gotta know what I think about the radiator. You gotta know what I think about the engine. You gotta know what I think about the steering wheel. You gotta know what I think about the suspensions. You gotta know what I think about the car in detail. How can you live the love of Jesus if you don't know what He said? If you don't understand what He said? Impossible. Impossible. Let me give you another voice that will tell you to go away from the text. See, I've already given you four, three. I'm going to give you four. The text kills. The spirit builds up. Oh, people love to say that nowadays. People love to say that nowadays. The letter kills, but the spirit gives life. That's a, such a bad misinterpretation of the words of Paul. See, here's what Paul said about the law. That the law is good. Let me tell what the law is. First and foremost, let me tell what the Bible, what the law is. The law is a reflection of who God is. Is God forever past, forever future? Good, yes. Is the law forever past and forever future? Good, let me tell you how good the law is. Let me tell you how good the law is. In heaven, which is the perfect place, the law will be followed perfectly. Let me tell you why heaven is heaven. Because there will be no dying there. No killing. There will be no lying. There will be no laziness. There will be no disease. There will be no covetousness. There will be no disrespect. There will be no adultery. If, if there is none of these problems, what else do you want to call that but heaven? Heaven is the place where the law of, where the law of Jesus is perfectly followed. Is the law good? Very, very good. But they say, no, Philippe, the letter will kill me. The spirit will give me life. No. no. Let me tell you one thing. God is never, ever, 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 ever detached, disassociated from his law. How do you know God? Through the Bible. That's it. It's the only place that reveals God to us perfectly. Only there. No one else. No one else. Now we continue on verse 16. He said, my doctor. My doctrine is not mine, but his who sent me. Guys, this is our goal. We carry a doctrine. Let us carry a doctrine that is not ours, but actually the Father's. Yet again, I insist. I insist yet again. I'm not going to finish, by the way, at all this sermon. <laughs> Sorry. 
I'm so sorry. I insist with you. Be careful with your own opinions. Guys, be careful. Let, let me tell you what the Bible, the Bible's opinion about your heart. Desperately corrupt. Why do you rely on your own opinion? Why should I think that my opinion, that my feelings, that my perception stands a chance against the Bible? No, they don't. No, they don't. I want, I need the text. I need, I need the spirit here. And how do I get that? By reading, by praying, by seeking it. it isn't, by the way, isn't that exactly what Jesus did? I think he was 14 years old. I think 14. And where was he found? Mom and dad went crazy. Like, where is the boy? The boy disappeared. If, where did they find him? Debating with the doctors in the temple. Why was he there? To learn. To learn. I, I remember this other gentleman from South Africa, this gentleman. I met him in New Zealand. And he said, Philippe, I don't think people should study the Bible. I think they should only read the Bible, but not study it. If you study it, you're going to misunderstand it. You should just read it and feel it and live it. Let me tell you what, what is fundamentally wrong. These people, they, they, they divorce something that is, should never be divorced. They divorce theory from practice. And sometimes they think, you know what? The Bible is just a bunch of theory. Theory, theory, theory. Oh, nice and fine, but only theory. But they don't have any bearing on real life. It's exactly the opposite. For, I mean, to begin with, who can live right by knowing wrong? Tell me that. Tell, tell me that. Have you ever met somebody that was, that was a fantastic person to be around? That every time you work near him, you, your heart was warm. You were happy. You were motivated just, just to be near him. And that person had a messed up head. Have you ever met that person? That, that's, that's a contradiction in terms. That's like dry water. That's like something that doesn't, in and out of itself, doesn't exist. There is no such thing as doing right without knowing right. So why why do you need to know right? Because we ought to do right. And another thing, I don't know where people take this idea that theological studies are dry and lifeless. Where do they get that idea? Now, maybe they're reading very, very, very bad authors. Or let me tell you what I really think. I think they're not reading at all. Do you know what I think? I think they heard somebody say that and they are lazy to study. So they repeat that so they don't need to study. And they still come off good. I think that's what the real problem is. Let me give an example. Let me give an example. A lot, one doctrine that many people say has no practical relevance whatsoever. The Trinity. Think about, think about that. They say the Trinity is good for one thing. If you don't believe it, you go to hell. But in practical terms, the Trinity changes nothing. Let me show you how this person is wrong. I have Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Three distinctive persons. In one God essence, one divine essence, one Godhead. So I see there an indistinguishable triunity. I see there that is one, but there are three working there. So I can know that that God is a relational God. 
And because he is relational, he relates to himself. The Father relates to the Son. The Son relates to the Spirit. The Spirit relates to the Father and to the Son. The Son to the Spirit and the Father. The Father to the Son and to the Spirit. And I, when I see that they relate to each other, I see that my own relationships should mirror that. Doesn't that have practical implication? A little bit more for you. When I look at the Trinity, I see that those three persons are perfectly united. And they are not true three gods, but they are only one. And when I observe my reality, what do I find in my reality? I find that my very reality is like that. Take matter, for example. Matter is solid or liquid or gas. Three. But all matter. Take time. Past, present, future. All time. Still time. Take the three dimensions. Uh, the reality where you live right now. You live in a 3D reality, isn't it? Width, length, height. Take the basic structure of a society, which is family. Father, mother, children. Take music, melody, harmony, rhythm. So when I behold my own reality, I see that God left the imprints there. I see God's fingerprints in my reality. So what do I come up, what do I deduce from that? That my reality comes from God. It's not that God is in my reality. It's that He is the utmost reality. He is the final reality. And I live in Him. Isn't that what Paul said? We move and we live in Him. Paul said that. So my trinity, oh, forgive me, the trinity tells me that I have a reality that came from them. You want to tell me that's not relevant? Now, people that disregard this, do you know what they say? Let me tell you what they say. When you start talking about the Bible, they say, ah, that's just church talk. Get real, man. <laughs> Let me get real. Get real about what? Reality is God. And <laughs> you tell me that I should not be talking about God with the words, get real. <laughs> The, the, the real person is the one that acknowledges reality. God is reality. There is no reality apart from him. Oh, but the Trinity is just a concept. No, no. Let me tell you the day that we, we, shall, we shall be in deep trouble. And I'm, I'm going to end the sermon here. And half of the sermon here. The other half next Sunday. Let me tell you the day that you and I are in deep, deep trouble. When we, when we divorce the following. Doctrine and practice. The day we make the divorce. Yeah, I don't even know what I, what, what I say to you now. I, I, I don't even say, I don't even know. It's... It's most likely the worst day of your life. The day you divorce doctrine in practice. The day you think that the Jesus of the Bible is different than Jesus today is the day you are in deep, deep trouble. The day you think that the Bible has nothing to move you the day you think that the Bible is so old, so old, so old, that it will bring nothing new to you, that's the, that's the day you and I die. That day we die to God. We're not alive to God. Next Sunday we'll be seeing on the text that false doctrine actually brings death. This text will show this next Sunday. But the doctrine of Jesus, oh, he brought life. He brought life and life so beautiful that even the Jews were like, this man is phenomenal. How can he know so much without studying letters? Because he has a divine doctrine. That's it. His doctrine is from God. 
We have a doctrine that comes from the Lord. We don't need anything new. Leave this church today passionate, passionate about the old. The old gospel, the old cross, the old Bible, the old Jesus. Let us pray. Blessed be your name, O Lord. You are amazing. You are amazing. Hallelujah. We worship you, Almighty God. We worship you. And we love you. Help us to love you more. Help us, O Lord, when we don't love you and we sin. That, that's it. That's the sin. The lack of love for you. But cause us to love you more. Cause us to be amazed with the old. The old Jesus, the old God, the old doctrine, the old Bible, the old church. Cause us to love the old evermore. In Jesus' name, amen.